All right, volume is good. Hi, everybody. We're gonna start things off with a little video of a website that has been called very slick by multiple media outlets. Uh, the Virgin America website you may have seen. It's an Angular website. It's really fancy. It's cut down on the number of screens that it takes you to buy a plane ticket. So we're gonna demo it in JAWS, which is a screen reader. Virgin America heading level one link. Tap. Book link. Tap. I don't see where I am on the screen. I can't really tell. Tap. 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 I'm just tabbing. Sign in link. Tap. Okay. Sign up link. Tap. San Francisco link. Oh, okay. I see that. Boston Mall left paren boss right paren link. Shift tap. San Francisco link. Okay. I guess I'm departing from somewhere. I don't know what I'm trying to book. Tap. Tap. Los Angeles CA left paren lax right paren link. Okay, I guess I'll just leave from Los Angeles. That's not very convenient, but tap, I don't know tap, how to use this website tap, if I can't tap, see it. Tap, 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 and tap, now it kicked me all tap, the way back to the top, Boston even though. Boston Mall left paren boss right paren link. Even though Enter. I should be down the screen. Boston oh. Mall left paren boss right paren link. There was an alert there. I don't know if you caught that, but at the top of the screen, when something happened, I made a selection. There was a big banner at the top that said, "Hey, you made a selection," but it didn't alert me. If I'm not a visual user, I have no idea that that occurred. So now I've been scrolled further down the page. This is part of a user experience that's very visual, but I have no idea where I am in this purchase flow. Tap. FT. Lauderdale FL. Tap. I don't see Fort New Lauderdale. York that's E-W-R somewhere else on the New screen. Tap. New York. Tap. San Francisco. Tap. All cities. Link. Tap. That's not what I'm One trying link. to find. It's frustrating. Tap. Add link. Tap. Subtract link. Okay, I must be related Shift to the tap. numbers now down below. Enter. Tap, tap, tap. Add link, tap, tap. Zero, tap. Add link, tap. Subtract link, tap. Still don't really know tap. what I'm Shift trying to do tap. here. Can tap. Shift, tap. Enter. So there's another alert. I didn't tap. hear it. Show, tap. Shift, tap. Shift, now I'm on tap. the calendar selection. Continue with two adults link. Tap. Show more dates link. Shift I'm skipping tab. before and after the calendar, and I can't figure out how I'm going to book these dates. So not only have I picked a destination and a departure city that I didn't really want, I just couldn't use this thing. So that's really unfortunate. It's a really slick website, but not if you're using a key- keyboard or a screen reader. So that's a good segue. What could improve that? If it was accessible, then anybody could use it, because a website shouldn't discriminate uh, to say, oh, well, if you can't see, well, you're not going to fly on virginamerica.com. That's a real miss. So we should talk about accessibility, because obviously, out in the real world, people are forgetting about it. Accessibility to me means that my friends and family can use any website that either I have created or that I send out in a tweet or Facebook. Uh, it also means that if I lost my eyesight or my hearing, I would be able to continue to use the apps and websites that I used before. Another way to think about it, the actual definition here is accessibility means that everyone can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web, and they can contribute to the web. So if you're building dev tools or some tool, there are blind developers, there are people of all different abilities that they need our help. If you're the type of person that responds more to numbers, here are some numbers for you from the European Disability Forum. 80 million Europeans have disabilities. That's 15% of the population, according to their figures. That's a lot of people. So really, we could think that accessibility is about people. It's about your neighbors, your family. It could be you in the future. So we should be taking care to make sure that the, the user experiences that we create and the interfaces that we code are accessible to everybody. You might be thankful later that you actually took some time. So today, I'm going to talk about JavaScript for everybody, and specifically uh, accessibility of JavaScript MVC frameworks. I'm Marcy Sutton. I'm a developer at Substantial in Seattle, where currently I'm contributing to Angular's material design components. So I'm going to have a lot of Angular in my code today. But that's not because it's my favorite or anything like that. It's just what I happen to be most familiar with. I also co-chair and instruct for Girl Develop It in Seattle, which is a really great organization. It's an awesome way to give back to my community and support my fellow women in tech. Oh, and my goal today 
you should remember that, is that I want to arm you with the ideas and the, the concepts that you need to make your websites accessible and your JavaScript applications. This is very front-end focused. It's obviously very tied to your HTML and your CSS, but we're focusing on the JavaScript delivery part of that. You're creating HTML with JavaScript, so we should know what it takes to make that accessible. The canonical example for an MVC framework is the to-do MVC application. There's a ton of frameworks out there. You may, you may have a favorite. The baseline of these frameworks differs, whether they are accessible, how much support they can give you. Um, but some of the ones I've worked with are Backbone, Spine, Angular, a little bit of Ember. I haven't yet used React, but I'm really curious about that. So if you have ideas about React accessibility, come find me. I'd love to hear about it. Um, then there's other frameworks, like Famous, that have admitted that they are not supporting accessibility yet. It's a hard problem for them that they haven't been focused on from the start. So I would challenge you to really consider whether you need to use a framework for a production site that has admitted that it's not accessible. That's kind of irresponsible, so choose wisely. But we're going to focus on the common aspects of MVC frameworks that uh, it, it doesn't really matter which one you choose. The, the common things in these frameworks are that they are client-rendered applications. So you're using JavaScript to inject HTML, make it interactive. You typically separate your code into different concerns, models, views, controllers, routers, whatever the pattern is that you're using. It doesn't really matter. It's the quality of your application. It's client-rendered, it's asynchronous, and it has a really snappy, responsive interface. How do we make that accessible? So that's what we're going to talk about. So are your apps accessible? It could depend on a few things. As I mentioned before, it could depend on the framework. If you're using Famous, probably not. If you're using Angular or Ember, you probably have a similar starting point. They will give you a little help. Um, and if you're, if you're trying to choose a framework, you should consider the things that we're going to talk about today. It could also depend on the screen reader and browser combination that your end user is using to access your site. And then finally, your code is the biggest variable here. And I have asterisks next to the framework and your code being the things that you could potentially control to varying degrees. Your code, obviously, we're going to focus on that. That's the thing you have the most control over. But you could also contribute back to the frameworks on GitHub. That's what I'm doing with Angular, is to try and make that more accessible, get the framework to help you a little more and do the heavy lifting. So if there are ways that you can contribute back to a framework, do it. It's awesome. So the goal or the, the, the reason that you're probably all sitting here today is you want to know what is it in single page applications specifically that is challenging with accessibility. Uh, I have listed first manage ARIA attributes. And we'll talk about what ARIA is and how you can use it. I have it listed first because of the big push for web components, custom controls, in Angular, there are directives. Ember has custom components. You're creating custom HTML elements that have no definition. They have no semantics, no meaning, no states, no properties. So you want your framework to help you manage adding those attributes so that you can communicate to users of assistive technologies, be it a screen reader or a screen magnifier, communicate to them in a non-visual way the state of your application and the purpose of it. Next, we're going to talk about enabling the keyboard. And this is not rocket science. It is not really hard, but yet we always forget about it. And Virgin America was a big offender of that. When I tabbed through the page, there was no visual focus style. There was no way for me to know where I was on the page. And then we're also going to talk about handling focus. This is tied along with enabling the keyboard. But in a JavaScript MVC application, sometimes, depending on your templating system, or your templating solution, you might be updating your, your application by ripping out parts of the DOM and putting them back. If you're using a keyboard, that can be sometimes a problem. As we saw with Virgin America, when it changed the screen, we didn't get a page reload. It just scrolled me further down the page. But for some reason, my focus was jumped all the way to the top. So for a keyboard user, that's not a really fun user experience. It isn't what you would call slick. So we need to manage focus. If we're ripping out the DOM and putting it back, we need to tell, help the user guide them through the experience by sending their focus around. That's a really useful thing in JavaScript MVC applications. And then you should remember that before creating these custom controls or adding ARIA, you should try to write meaningful HTML and use native HTML wherever possible. And lastly, I'm not going to really touch on this much today, but in MVC apps, uh, we saw it on Virgin America when there was a big alert at the top, and it didn't actually tell me if I was a non-visual user. 
you need to alert the user that things are happening in the screen, that maybe, maybe their focus is on one part of the application and there's something happening elsewhere. It's filtering or maybe the, they had a, an error in their form submission. We need to actually tell the user that something else is happening. So let's talk about ARIA. ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. The idea here is that it's a set of attributes that you can use to expand HTML's semantic vocabulary. You can fill in the gaps where maybe HTML doesn't have, you're creating custom elements, so you actually have to define what those are. Uh, if you think of a, a form input that has properties, it, it could be disabled, it could be required. Uh, in a screen reader, it's communicated that that is a form element. If you're creating a custom element, you don't get any of that for free. But you can use ARIA to add some of that meaning. So let's look at the pieces. The first core component of ARIA is the role. And you could think of this as, what does this thing do? My example here is I have a div, and it has a style of a background image in line. And you might think, why isn't that just an image tag? Well, if you've ever built a responsive website, you might know that CSS background images have a few more options. And maybe you want to make scaling background images. It, the, in the real world, this happens. And so to communicate the purpose of this div, which is presentation related, I can make it a more one-to-one -one experience by communicating that this is an image. So if I add a role of image to this div, all it has on it is a style of a background image. That communicates the purpose of this to a user. They can't see the image necessarily, but at least they know that it's an image. It's not just some empty div sitting there. The next piece in ARIA core components is the state, the current condition of this particular thing. I mentioned an a form input might be required or disabled. A uh, state tip tends to change depending on the state of the application. Here I have a, a material input, which is like a custom input tag. And since it's a custom element, I can't make use of the actual disabled attribute. So you might wonder, why would I use ARIA if there already is a disabled attribute? Well, the disabled attribute only works on certain elements. So if you're creating a custom one, you need to expand this vocabulary. The ARIA disabled is going to tell a screen reader that that item is disabled. And then you can update it depending on what the interface is doing. And then lastly, in ARIA core components, there are properties. These tend to change less often than states. It's the nature of the current object. So I have a donor kebab element here. Uh, it's not a taco button this time, but it has an ARIA label to describe what this thing is. It's a donor kebab. It might have Angelina Fabro bringing us lunch. Not today. I'm sorry to get your hopes up. Um, but the ARIA label is just an off-screen piece of information that tells a screen reader what this thing is. It's really useful. Actually, in form inputs, sometimes every form input needs a label. Sometimes you might not have a label as part of your design. Either you could put a label element off screen, or you could just add ARIA label directly on the input, and it will add context to a non-visual user. So a little bit about using roles. Firstly, they're element types, like we saw with the image. There's also headings. Let's see, what else is there that you might use? Um, there's links, forms, um, where's some other ones, lists. The idea with a role is that it communicates what the type of element is, and it will actually be announced in a screen reader. Secondly, roles can be used as landmarks. And by landmarks, it means that for a screen reader, they can actually jump around the page without having to use the tab. Um, they could navigate through the page by uh, navigation elements, or maybe you have a main element indicating the main body of your document. So those are useful to users who maybe aren't using a mouse. So you also want to start with native HTML tags, as I said, because you get a lot for free. You get attributes, you get keyboard events if it's an interactive control. But if you must use custom elements, go read the ARIA documentation, which I have linked here in my slides. Because what that will tell you is if you're using a certain role, what the expected keyboard behavior is. Maybe if it's a button, you expect it to be engaged with the space bar. So those are things that you need to know so that when a, a certain role is announced in a screen reader, that user who is expecting it to behave in a certain way, you will have already thought of that, and you can easily bind the JavaScript events to make it work the way they expect. And then lastly, don't overdo it. There is such a thing as too much ARIA. You want the simplest abstraction possible to communicate the purpose, state, and the properties of your application at any given time. One role that we should talk about is the application role. 
And it might be tempting to put this on your JavaScript MVC apps because, well, they're applications. But there's a concept here in screen readers that you should know about. There are different modes in a screen reader. Uh, the default is what's called a virtual cursor. This mode does not pass every key back to the browser directly. It's like a buffer in between the user and the browser. So we talked about landmarks and how there are ways that a screen reader user can navigate a page using different key commands. Well, the virtual cursor is what actually handles those. So if you disable it, which you have control of, of disabling it with this role of application, if you disable it, then you're going to send every keyboard command directly to the browser. So if the user is trying to navigate by headings, they might not be able to. You want to limit use of this to interactive controls that are more advanced, that actually mimic desktop applications specifically. So I'd say, unless you have a really good reason and you know how to use this role, just avoid it. And especially, don't put it on the body element. <laughs> Even though it's tempting, uh, this can cause some problems. I have an animated GIF here of a guy doing a body roll and just body rolling away from his responsibilities, because that's what you're probably going to do if you use this role. And meanwhile, you are probably going to be uh, making your application unusable to people with disabilities. So how do you decide whether to use the application role? If I have a Sparkle Party application, for example, and it has a couple advanced things in it, like a disco ball that maybe if you start dancing, it will spin the disco ball. Uh, it kind of looks like an application, but it has a heading in it. It has a button, things that have, maybe the user would navigate by headings. So we don't want to disable the virtual cursor. Uh, but in the disco ball element, maybe it could, but it's probably going to add more, tr cause more trouble than it's worth, so I'm just going to leave it off. But one thing I did add in my little pseudocode application here is inside of my disco ball element, I have a canvas that's going to render some visual output of the disco ball. How would the non-visual user know that anything is happening? How can I make this more interesting to somebody who can't see the disco ball on the canvas? Well, I've added a paragraph that I can just append text to. And there's a concept in ARIA called ARIA Live. And this would have been really useful on virginamerica.com whenever they had those banners at the top. If, we, if they had added an ARIA Live element somewhere, either off screen, it has to be rendered, so it can't have display none on it. But if you have this thing in the page somewhere, and if it has ARIA Live of either polite or assertive, uh, differing levels of rudeness, you could say, once you append text to this thing, it will read it aloud in the screen reader. So from our disco ball, maybe when the disco ball starts turning, we could send an alert to the ARIA Live region. Maybe when it stops, we could say, all right, you're cool, you can stop dancing. Because if the disco ball is not spinning, why, why are you dancing? So that's some ARIA stuff. Let's talk about the keyboard. Um, this is something that we forget quite often. And it is pretty low-hanging fruit, stuff that you can do to really improve the state of the web. The easiest thing you could do is add a tab index. So tab index here I have on a div. A div is not an interactive control by default. Swap out div for material input or some Ember custom component or any element that is not already in the tab order. By adding a tab index of 0, you add it to the tab order. So I can tab onto it. Content editable is an attribute you can add in your HTML, and that does the, a similar thing. So if it has tab index of 0, I can tab onto it. Um, if I add tab index of negative 1, it pulls it out of the tab order, but I can still use JavaScript to script focus to it. It's useful. Um, I will say avoid numbers higher than 0. Because what that means is that you are determining the actual tab order of everything in your page. And unless you want to manage every single tab index, you can easily lose track. And then all of a sudden, your footer is, comes before everything else on the page. So if you just use 0, it'll keep the natural order of your, your HTML hierarchy. It'll make a lot more sense. So make a logical tab order. An example of what not to do. I see this all the time. And it's pretty easy to fix. But I have a div that has a, just a CSS class on it, and then it has an ng click of toggle menu. And I'm using Angular here because it cuts down on the amount of code that I have to show you. I can just bind JavaScript directly onto the HTML. It's not a judgment about whether it's better, whether you should use Angular. It's just really easy for me to show it to you. Um, but you could imagine this abstracted into a separate JavaScript file with your framework of choice. But the click event that we've bound here, I have this little hamburger button. Um, if I click it, it opens a menu. 
But if I try to tab onto it, I can't get to it. I just skip around every element that has tab index around this thing. So don't do that. If you have a, a hamburger menu, it should be in the tab order. It should really be a button, not a div, but this happens. So how do we fix this? If I have a button and I add a, ta add a tab index to it, and OK, it has a click, you'd think this would work. But if I tab onto it, like that's, woohoo, we made progress. But if I hit the Enter key, I can't engage this thing, which is a bummer. What's up with that? That means we can't see the spicy chihuahua dancing in the background. Not cool. So how do we fix this now? So by adding tab index, we can tab onto the dance button. We add a role of button, because this is a custom element, so I want to communicate that this is a button to a non-visual user. I have the ng click the same, but the extra step, because this is a custom element, I added tab index to make it so you could tab onto it, but it doesn't natively fire the, the key press event that we need. So if I add an ng key press and then fire the same event as the click event or the same function, all of a sudden, I can hit the space bar, we can dance. <laughs> All right. Let's dance more after this, though, because that's awesome. So one little last piece of low-hanging fruit that I would really love to see, because this would have helped Virgin America a lot, is any element that has tab index. Uh, this is kind of a pseudo selector here of tab index of zero. Just think of that as any element that's in the tab order. If you define a hover style in your CSS, define a focus style just right along with it. Knock it out at the same time. It's super easy. But you got to remember that you can't focus on something that you can't tab onto. I know this is JSConf, but this is super easy win. Just do it. So you might be wondering why I'm wearing gold pants. I don't know if you were wondering about that, but um, I just think they're kind of fun to wear. But I was inspired by Tom Dale, co-creator of Ember.js and wearer of party pants. And thanks to Matthew Bergman for the photo. Um, I figured when I was creating an Ember, component or an Ember demo, since I haven't used it in production on a website, that I would make it related to gold pants. And so to make it accessible, I could add a caption to these. So right now I have existing caption options of Ow My Eye and Shiny. Uh, we could say Tom Dale's fantastic gold shorts. If I hit Enter, my little demo just adds it to a list of radio buttons. And then if I click it, it will select and then because I have bound this attribute in my Ember demo, uh, we can see down here in the dev tools that it now has an alt attribute of Tom Dale's fantastic gold shorts. So it dynamically updated without having to refresh the page. Um, it added context to this little demo. Um, it, it illustrates that Ember can be used to dynamically update attributes. So let's go look at some code of how that worked. Custom components in Ember are pretty cool. It's kind of a similar idea to Angular directives, where you can create custom elements. The default element of a custom component in Ember is a div. But if I wanted to actually spit out a custom element, say, party pants, I could change the tag name here. In my, where I set up my custom component, I can change the tag name. But if I'm spitting out a custom element, I need to add some aria to it. So if I add an aria role here, another um, property that Ember will give you. I'm just going to give it an article. It's, it's not the most meaningful element ever, but um, I can actually communicate that it's a little more interesting than a div. And then lastly, Ember will really help you out here with attribute bindings. I'm binding a tab index here. Um, attribute bindings are things that you can dynamically compute values and update them on the fly. This is the Ember way of updating attributes. So. Are there places where your framework can help you do some heavy lifting? In Angular, there are places where we're trying to make that better. And if you have ideas for other frameworks, by all means, go contribute, because it's really cool to see this stuff starting to help us out a little bit. So I have an example here of Angular UI Bootstrap. They have an accordion group component that it comes with two properties, is open and is disabled. Those don't mean anything in ARIA speak. So how could we add those? If I manually added them in line, I could say add aria expanded of true or false to indicate whether the accordion is open or closed. I could add aria disabled if I wanted to communicate whether it's disabled or not. This is kind of verbose all of a sudden, though. Like, how can I reduce 
uh, this redundancy? How can I make this simpler? Well, if your framework, if you put in a single attribute, say ng expanded or ng disabled, and then the framework actually injected the ARIA for you, well, then that framework is helping you out because those are less points that your application could break. Uh, it's things where the framework is just handling it for you. Um, you might think, though, it, it might be useful, though, if the framework would detect whether you'd already added ARIA. Um, so those are things that we look at when we add stuff like this. So I mentioned earlier I've been contributing to Angular's material design components. These are reusable components. The idea is to create a set of styled components that people can just drop into their applications. Um, they weren't very accessible when I was brought onto the project, which is, I guess, why they brought me onto the project. But it's been really cool going and adding ARIA to these things. Good example is the, um, the radio buttons. They have this pattern where you have a wrapping element. It's a material radio group element. That could be, that looks a lot like our party pants element all of a sudden. It doesn't have any semantics. It doesn't have any tab index. It doesn't communicate what it does. Inside of the material radio group, there are individual components of a material radio button. Those don't have any meaning either. So how do we add that? Well, the real life version of this now that I've gotten to spend some time with it, and this is a little simplified to reduce the amount of code that you have to look at, but on the outer wrapping radio group directive, I'm adding a role of radio group to communicate what this thing is. I'm adding a tab index so that you can actually get to this control. And then I'm wiring a key down. Because if you remember our, our little dance button with the chihuahua, you couldn't fire that with the keyboard. So if we wire a key down, and then I check if you're using the left arrow or the right arrow, then I can fire the events to change the radio button. Because when you go and read the spec for ARIA, if you go to look at the role for radio group, you'll learn that the expected pattern for a keyboard user is that you tab onto the control, and then you use the arrow keys to toggle individual radio buttons. So that's why it's important to go and read the ARIA spec. So then if we dive down into the individual radio buttons inside of this parent element, we can add a role of radio to each individual radio element. Um, and then we can add an ARIA label to say what the thing is. We can update the ARIA checked attribute to communicate whether it is engaged or not. So depending on the type of control, with these, it was pretty obvious that there were existing ARIA patterns that just worked, they mapped directly onto this um, material component stuff. But you might be creating more innovative custom controls that maybe ARIA hasn't already established a pattern. You have to use your subjective brain power to determine what might be appropriate for those elements. But for this, it was pretty obvious that uh, the, the existing ARIA patterns worked really well. The radio group, the radio, all of that sort of stuff. So that is about it for me today. But I have some slides for you. If you want to grab them, they're on GitHub. I have a short URL of tiny.cc slash mvc dash a11y. And there I have a couple of resources here. I wrote a blog post on auditing a website for accessibility. If you're just getting started, that lists some tools and some techniques you can use to determine what it, what's happening with my websites and mobile apps. So that might be useful. Also, the Chrome accessibility dev tools are pretty useful because they can just help flag problems with your apps, help you diagnose them, and figure out how to fix them. And then the accessibility project might be a little useful. So. We are going to end with a dance party because I, we're in Berlin. And when are you? When else are you going to do the German sparkle party? Thanks, everybody.